together for worship that's already taking place. We pray now, Lord, as uh, we get into your word that you would uh, speak to our hearts this morning and that uh, we would be willful to hear and listen and willing to obey, Lord, and be disciples ourselves of you. We pray, Lord, for that one that may be here today that's never been saved 
But they'll also ask this question this morning. And Lord, they'll get an answer and leave here as a child of God. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll pick up with verse 25 this morning. So what about verses 21 through 24? If you were here last Sunday morning and I know that we ended in verse 20 and remember that, well, we, uh, we did 21 through 24 on Wednesday night, this past Wednesday night, uh, as it was kind of a little section to itself and not a very long section to bridge into uh, this next section, which is a little bit longer of a section uh, that really goes from 25 through 37. We just won't get all of it today. Uh, and if you're on the uh, Prayer Warriors text group, you wondered why we got, I sent out a picture of laughing Jesus. Well, that comes from uh, Wednesday night in verse 21. So, uh, again, we covered that. So we pick up this morning on, on verse 25, and, and we get the most important question that appears in Scripture. Uh, a certain lawyer, or really what we would call, when we're, when we're looking at that religious elite model and group, it's a scribe. Uh, a lawyer was somebody who was an expert in the law. Scribes were expert in the law because they had wrote it over and over again. They knew exactly what the law said. They knew what it didn't say. Uh, and again, that's why we should be good stewards of, of the Word. We ought to know what the Word says and what it doesn't say. Right. We ought to be able to hear when somebody says something that they say is in the Word and know that it's not in the Word. And when somebody says that something's not in the Word but it is in the Word, we should be able to tell them. It's in the Word. So, really, we ought to all be good scribes. We ought to all be good lawyers uh, as far as this definition goes. But, but that's who this is. And he stands up uh, and in the middle of the crowd, in the middle of what's going on, and he's going to tempt Jesus with a question. But, but the question is a good question, even though he's using it for the wrong reason. And even though in the answer uh, at the end, we don't believe he really gets it the way he should, it's a good question. It's a question that gets asked throughout Scripture, gets asked throughout all the Gospels, gets asked throughout uh, the New Testament. You can just go specifically, you can go to the rich young ruler and, and, and that story. You could go to the group of people in John 6 and that conversation they're having. You can go to the Philippian jailer in Acts and look at how he asks it. And, and, and the questions will range from what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be saved? Uh, maybe in our language, in our vernacular, how it gets asked, maybe I'll say, what do I do to go to heaven? Uh, all those are referencing the same thing. They're all referencing eternal life, and they all get tied together. How do you get eternal life? You get saved. How do you get to heaven? You get saved. You don't go to heaven unless you're saved. You don't have eternal life unless you're saved. So they all get tied together really as the same question, even though they may be asked uh, in different ways. We, we've talked about this many times in many ways, but I found it again this week in a worldly setting, uh, and of all places, watching the television and watching Family Feud. <laughs> watching Family Feud, I get a kick out of watching Family Feud. But here's the question on Family Feud. We asked 100 people, what would keep you from going to heaven? My ears perked up. This is going to be great. Because there's only one answer, but on the board there's like six answers. So I want to see what are folks going to say? What will keep you from going to heaven? Number one answer, lying. Well, we all, we all going to hell, folks. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to heaven. If lying's going to keep you from going to heaven, none of us is going to make it. Jesus is there by himself. Yeah. And hell is full of everybody else that's ever been born. I think the number two answer was stealing. Oh, preacher, I ain't thinking yeah, you stole in your life. You stole lots of stuff, whether you admit it or not. Whether it was time or pen from work or on April 15th, you stole. So that knocks us all out. There was... I don't even remember how they phrased some kind of sexual immorality. I don't know. I don't remember how that came up. But all these, and you know, you watch Family Feud. They get to the end, and 
That family gets their three strikes, and the other family gets a chance to steal it. They get their strike, and then you get what's left up there. They go over it. Well, by the time both families had answered, neither one of them had said the real reason yet. And I, with my interest peaked, was wondering, in those that are still left up there, is the real answer going to be there? Yeah. And I'd be honest with you, I didn't think it would. But I got a little faith in, in that, that there were some saved people in amongst the hundred people that got asked this question. I never get asked those questions. I'm never in the hundred, but... There were some saved folks who were, because about the third or fourth answer was not believing. And that's the most concise way of answering the right way. The only thing that keeps you from going to heaven is not believing the gospel. Amen. Not believing the good news of Jesus Christ. But everybody's got their own ideas. Well, What's going to keep me from going to heaven is what I do yeah. or how I act or the things that are listed on my godly, heavenly resume. And, and really, that's kind of what this fellow jumps up and says. He says, what must I do? The problem is we get caught up too much in the I's and the do's and the me doing something to be saved. And then we'll get to it in a second. There is something we do. There is a, a, a personal accountability there. But that's not the idea most have when they hear I do. They think of, what's my list? What do I have to check off? What's got to be on my resume? What boxes have got to be filled in so that when it's time and I go stand before Peter at the pearly gates, because that's the idea that most people have, you know, what's it going to be that lets me in? What can I do? What can I make sure I've done? And what do I need to make sure I'm not doing so I don't get told that I can't come in? Well, again, we'll see in the text today. This scribe stands up and asks Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know, most folks will agree that they believe in an eternal life. Whether they count it as heaven or what they talk about Jesus or, or most people, there, even folks that have no concept of God or even folks who don't believe in our God and our Jesus, they still believe in some type of afterlife, eternal life, something beyond this life here on earth. And you'll hear people will talk about maybe someone who's dead and gone or passed away looking down on them. It's amazing. Everybody thinks of eternal life's going to be up there. Nobody ever talks about being down there and looking up, you know. When in the reality, there is a down there and there are people looking up. But nobody wants to talk about that. It's all we They're looking down. Or any funeral you go to, you know, it's, it's going to get mentioned and They'll talk about those things that happen in heaven. Whether everybody in the crowd says, well, that person didn't go to heaven. Or that person went to heaven. I'm sure I'm getting to go to heaven. And you get off on all these tangents that are all wrong. But most people believe that there is something uh, after that. And that's the first thing that gets acknowledged by this scribe. He knows there's an eternal life because he asked the question. Now, it says he's asking him to tempt him. Because remember, they're right now still trying to plot. Jesus, he's in the final months of his life. They want him dead. They've been trying to catch him. They're tempted because in their mind, Jesus breaks the law of God. He breaks the Mosaic law. He breaks the laws that they have themselves memorized, rehearsed, and can tell you that they don't break and you do break, etc., etc., etc. So he's got the idea that there is an eternal life. And he's got the idea that you can do something to get it. So that's the first thing that gets acknowledged. And we need to make that the first thing we acknowledge that. We know everybody in here is going to live forever. Physically, you're going to die. But you're going to live forever in eternity in one of two places. You're going to live in eternal torments and pain and hell. Or you're going to live in eternal joys in the presence of the Savior that saved you in heaven. But you're going to spend eternity in one of those two places. That lawyer knew it. That scribe knew it. We know it. We understand it. But we don't talk about it much. 
Because it's getting to be that both are unpopular. So we mean both are. Well, we, we know hell's unpopular. Nobody wants to talk about hell. You talk about hell, you got to talk about sin. You got to talk about judgment. You got to talk about the depravity of all humans, including yourself. Nobody wants to talk about that stuff. But here's the thing that you, you start thinking about. makes sense. Heaven's starting to become unpopular. Yeah. Talking about heaven is beginning to be unpopular. Because too many of us want to stay here. We think everything that is about life and everything that we've put our investments in and everything that we've considered and done and worked towards is here. And we get caught up in, in being here. Where Jesus told us, but be careful about that. Be careful where your treasure is. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And heaven's getting to be unpopular because our hearts are stuck here and not over there. Maybe it's because we don't quite understand there. Maybe it's because we can't quite get a picture of there. Maybe it's because we're human beings and we're short-sighted and, and we know here, we know what we got here, we don't quite know it, exactly understand there. Maybe it's because we live in a Western civilization and society that uh, is, is eat up with, with materialism and the things uh, uh, that you can accumulate and have. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But I know we get way caught up too much in being here. Witnessing and spreading the gospel and preaching the gospel is hard day because we, I say we, because I'm caught up in it too. We can't get our attention off of here and get our attention on over there. And we don't realize what we're missing out by not concentrating on what's over there instead of what's here. Now, the older you get, the sweeter over there gets. But even then, I don't think we still quite fully grasp over there, up there, heaven. And we don't fully turn loose and let go of here and what's in the world. In, in order to really get the gospel out, we have to get people's attention off this world. We have to stop talking and concentrating about this life. It's not about this life. It's about eternal life. It's about the life to come. But we have a hard time getting off this life because we get caught up in so much else. And you've heard me say it, and I don't care if you may, I'm going to say it again. The gospel never says nothing about being healthy and being wealthy. I'm sorry. It don't. Most of the heroes in this world were neither one, really. And it doesn't tell us that. The gospel does not promote getting a bigger, better SUV or getting a lake house or a beach house that you got a second place to go live at. The gospel has nothing to do with that. That's getting preached. And that's getting followed by a lot of folks. But the gospel and God's word never says anything else about that. So we have to get our mind off this world and get to the right question and not the wrong question. We can't spend all our time seeking help with our current situations in this world. Because, folks, everything here is temporary. It's temporary. That house that you've worked your whole life to establish and raise your family in, it's temporary. It's temporary. It might burn down the ground, or it might be gone when the Lord comes back, but it's temporary. The health you have today, you may not have tomorrow, and one day you won't have it all. Amen. It's temporary. Your 401k that has gone up and down and up and down, and right now it's up, but it looks like it's going to go down. It don't matter, because in all situations, it's still just temporary. We can't get caught up in temporary. We have to get caught up in eternal. Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's not about this world. It's about eternal life and a heaven to come. So in actuality, the background of the question that he asked is the right question. And how he asked it is still a right question. There's nothing we can do, but there's still that question idea that he asked about a personal salvation. Salvation is personal. It is between you and God. It's not corporate. That's a very big point with this man and the thought of this time.
Because Jews thought they're all going to heaven because they were Jews. That that was it. I'm a Jew. I'm going to heaven. You're not a Jew. You're going to hell. And in their mind, that's what made the difference. And that had nothing to do with it. And Jesus is spreading that gospel. And God's word is plain and clear. There is a personal salvation. And there is accountability between man and God. And there is something that you have to do as far as human responsibility in receiving the gospel and being saved. But it's that idea of what you do that in total contrast to the idea that this man had in what he should do. So let's just get right to it. Let's get, get to the answer. What shall I do? Verse 26, Jesus answers his question with questions of his own. What is written in the law? How readest thou? Again, he's throwing this out there because they've accused Jesus of, of breaking the law. So Jesus turns around and gives it back to him and says, you know the law. You've read the law. You're a law. You're, you're an expert in the law. So what do you say that the law says? And how do you read it? How do you understand it? Even better, how do you recite it? You know what we mean, recite it? Well, Jews, good Jews, in their day, there's something they did twice a day. Twice a day, they recited exactly what verse 27 says. The, all the commandments of God, God's law are wrapped up into two. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. They'd say it in the morning, they'd say it at night. They'd say it in the morning, they'd say it at night. A good Jew said it 365 times 2. What is that, Jay? A lot. A lot. <laughs> That's a good answer. A lot. Like 730 maybe, something like that. They said it a lot. So Jesus just puts around and said, well, what's the law say? And do you understand what you recite every day, twice a day? Do you know what it says? Do you know what the law says? And boy, that's a great answer. Bingo. Do you know? He knew. He knew what he recited because he spits it out in verse 27. Again, if you've got a regular edition, verse 27 is in black. Just in case we don't get it, this is not Jesus. This is the lawyer. The lawyer says, and he, little case H, again, it's not Jesus saying this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. And thy neighbor as thyself. Bingo. Right answer. He gave the right answer. But Jesus also kind of asked him, but do you understand what you're saying? When you say that, do you understand exactly what you are saying? He knew the right answer. He knew what to say. But if he was honest with himself, he knew he couldn't do it. You know what do you mean he couldn't do it? Well, four times there in his answer, he says, all. With all. With all. With all. And with all. There's a problem. He couldn't do it with all. He didn't do it with all. Here's our problem. You can't do it with all. And I can't do it with all. If you can't do it with all, and you do it less than with all, you're coming up short. Amen. Paul said, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the lawyer knew the right answer. The right answer is, love God perfectly. Love your neighbor perfectly. The problem is, he couldn't do that. You can't do that. I can't do that. And that's the nagging issue of life that we have to confront. It's about love, not about the law. And that's why the whole law could be summed up in these two commandments in this one sentence, centering on love. First, the love of God. Secondly, the love of others. But he had the right answer. 
So Jesus tells him in 28, and he said unto him, now this is Jesus talking, thou hast answered right. Yeah. You're right. If you will love with all, perfectly, both God and your neighbor, he said, this do, and how do you get the answer right? Thou shalt live. Let me tell you something. You want to know how to get to heaven on your own? I'll tell you. You can do it. Love perfectly and therefore live perfectly. Never sin against God. Never sin against your neighbor. You can get to heaven. Go back to family feud. With a big X. It ain't happening. You've already messed that up. To be perfect, you got to be perfect. You're already not perfect, so you can't go back and fix that. So you're done. You're toast. You can't make it to heaven on your own. It is impossible. Jesus right. said, that's the right answer. Yeah, do it perfectly. You'll live forever. Jesus knows because he did it perfectly. And he is living forever now. But he's the only one to ever do it perfectly. You can't do it on your own. you got to have mercy and grace. And that's the problem with this fellow, with this lawyer. How do you know what's the problem? Well, look at verse 29. I want to look just the first half. We're going to save the second half, Lord willing, for next time because it will tie in to verses 30 through 37. First half of 29. But he, willing to justify himself. We get back to the problem. He has stood up. He has asked this question. Jesus has answered. And now he wants to show everybody that he can do and be what he's supposed to do to get himself to heaven because he's willing to justify himself. Here's the problem. He couldn't justify himself. Here's the problem. You can't justify yourself. Here's the problem. I can't justify myself. The only one that justifies us is a righteous God who looks at us if we've been saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his perfectness and his righteousness and puts that on us and therefore we get justified. If you are willing to justify yourself, if you really think you can get there on your own, I'm sad to say, sorry, no, I'm not sorry to say, and I'm just going to tell you the truth, you will open your eyes in hell one day. If that's how you think you're going to get there. If you are on family feud and your answer is, I won't get to heaven if I lie, you're going to hell. I won't get to heaven if I steal, you're, you're going to hell. I won't get to heaven if I don't believe in the gospel of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son. You put your faith in that, you can't go to hell. And it ain't because of what you did, it's because of what he did. And his perfect plan of salvation established and ordained before the beginning of the world. But here's the problem with this man. The same problem that many Jews have. I'm going to close this. Go if you would to Romans chapter 10. I love when you go to Romans or something. So let's go to Romans. Couldn't make everybody mad and go to Romans 9. I'm going to go to 10 and make you happy. I'm going to go to Romans 10. <laughs> Romans 10, starting verse 1. Paul, a Jew. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. This lawyer had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge of God. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. 
Verse 3 is what that lawyer did when he stood up and said what he said because he was willing to justify himself. Let me read 3 again. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. When you believe in him and you put your faith in him, that ends the law's demand of you and the indictment of you as a sinner because now you put your faith in one who hasn't sinned and God looks at you as one who hasn't sinned and the law no longer deems you guilty. You all say amen if you've been saved. Amen. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 9 is the answer to the question that the lawyer asked. The lawyer said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Paul gives the answer in verse 9, Romans 10, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou will go to heaven. Thou will inherit eternal life. Whatever phrase you want to put there, that is our justification. That is our salvation. That is what we do to do it, and God handles the rest of it. Amen. And if you're trying to do it any other way, you're never going to get there. But preacher, it just sounds so simple. Bingo. It is simple. So simple that Family Feud should have had one answer and both families should have missed it because it should have just been not believing and the rest of it should have been left off. Just keep in there. Just keep, well, I like to get to the end. Stay in Romans 10. Just, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What do you do to get eternal life? You call upon the name of the Lord. You put your faith in Him. You believe it in your heart. You profess it with your mouth. Bottom line, you can't do it on your own. Bottom line, you need a Savior. Good news, which is the definition of what the word gospel means. Gospel, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. From to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Only one way to be saved. Faith in Christ the Lord. Pastor, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Put your faith in the Savior that was born on Christmas Day. The Savior that died on Good Friday. The Savior that rose again on Easter Sunday morning. Put your faith in Him. Call upon His name and you shall be saved. Anything else, you will stay lost. And eternity rides in your answer to that question. While we stand, at least come to the verse of invitation. Open the altar up. If you'd like to come this morning and pray, we'd love to pray with you. Open the church doors, open the altar. We'll sing a verse, one verse of invitation. Why not they go?
five thirty. Um, remember service tonight at six o'clock. Make your plans. Be here, Brock. Would you dismiss? Let us pray.